This is my uh, first time to Rapid City. I moved to Minneapolis from California, and in December of last year, my wife and I and our then two dogs were towing a trailer driving through South Dakota, and it felt like we were driving on the moon because there was snow, it was windy, it was an odd sky, but it was great. It's a beautiful place, and everyone's been so nice. Uh, <clears throat> no, it is. I mean, it was very cold then, but this visit uh, yesterday and today, and I'm going to the Buffalo, or the, the Buffalo Roundup tonight, tomorrow. I'm very excited about that, so thank you for having me. We're going to try to make this as interactive as we can, including with all of you. But maybe let me start out um, with, the, with the first question. I mean, you're, you came here from Minneapolis. We know why you want to go to the Buffalo Round Rip, because that's like on everybody's bucket list. But why Rapid City? Why, as the, from the Federal Reserve, why are you here? Sure. Well, first of all, let me just back up for a moment. Most people don't know this, but 100 years ago, in 1913 to be exact, when Congress decided we need a central bank, they wanted to do something different. <clears throat> Most countries, they have a central bank, but the central bank is all headquartered in the capital city of the country. Congress said, well, we want a central bank, but we don't want all the power concentrated in Washington, D.C. or New York, so let's distribute the power. We've got the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System in Washington, and then we have 12 regional Federal Reserve banks, including the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, <clears throat> that are distributed around the country. And our jobs are to represent our region. So our region includes Minnesota, North and South Dakota, Montana, part of Michigan, and part of Wisconsin. So a big part of my job is to get out all across the region, and it's a big region, mind you, all of those states, to understand what's happening in the local economy so that when I go back to Washington, D.C. eight times a year, I was there last week, I think, all the weeks blur together for the Federal Open Market Committee meetings where we set interest rates for the country, Part of my job is to say, hey, here's what's happening in the Ninth District, and help shape, help inform our national policy making. And so I'm here because Rapid City, South Dakota is enormously important. Rapid City is an enormously important economic center within South Dakota. So I'm here to learn what's happening on the ground, what's going well, what are the challenges, how do you see the economy, what's happening with unemployment, how are people doing. We look at a lot of economic data, but that data doesn't mean as much unless we're meeting with people and saying, what are you really experiencing on the ground? And so that's why I'm here. And so I hope you'll take uh, Dr. Wilson up on that and ask me tough questions and give me your feedback so I can learn from you about what's happening here. Um, before we when you start thinking about those questions, because my next, um, my ne I'm going to start looking to you all with your hands up to see what you would like to ask Neil. Um, in the two days or so that you've been here, what surprised you? I don't think it's so much a surprise. Uh, I had a sense of this, but there's a real optimism in the culture, I think, of South Dakota. And so folks here in Rapid City are, with, with good reason, very proud of your city and the progress that the city has made, the development, uh, the downtown area, and people feel invested in continuing to take it forward. And so you know, I, like, I like optimists, right? If you're with a group of optimists who have the same goal, there's almost nothing you can't get done. And so I think that you know South Dakota and Rapid City has a lot going for it, uh, and that's great. I'd much rather work with people who are who want to roll up their sleeves and fix a problem than just sit around complaining about a problem. All right, smart people of Rapid City who are optimists, what are your questions? <laughs> and we've got some roving mics. So and, and honestly, I always say this to audiences, and I really I really mean it, which is show me respect by asking me your toughest question. And here's why I say that, because if you have a question you really want to know, there's a good chance somebody else has that same question. And I would rather you ask me that question and give me a chance to answer it than have a few of you go off wondering, gee, he didn't, nobody asked him the tough question. Oh, good. Now the hands are coming up. <laughs> uh, Marty Herman, can we, right down here in front. So I know Marty will have something hard. Thank you. So my name's Marty Herman. I work for a community bank just under a billion in size here in South Dakota and Nebraska is where our footprint is. One of the questions that our CEO who's here and our CFO who are here, one of the questions that we wanted to ask was if you could start over with the U.S. banking system, start from scratch, what would the composition of banks look like in the United States? And with that mix of community banks, regionals, super regionals, global, what's your ideal mix? Today. Boy, that's a good question. Um, 
I think they each have a role to play. I don't have a perfect mix in my, hand, in my head to say 25%, 25%, 25%, though that's not a bad place to start. I mean, there is a role for global banks to service multinational corporations, but there's a real challenge for global banks to understand what's happening in local communities, especially rural communities. It's very hard for big banks to have confidence to make a loan in a neighborhood that they don't know very well or they don't know the, the people that they're dealing with. You know, when I moved to Minneapolis, I uh, got a mortgage. I had to get a mortgage to buy my house. And I could not believe how shockingly painful the process was to get a mortgage. <laughs> I thought they were screwing with me because they knew who I was and they just wanted to needle me. And this was, I was dealing with a very large bank because I've moved around the country and uh, this, I've been with this bank now for a dozen years or so. It didn't matter that I'd been with them for a dozen years or so. It was just shockingly painful. And so on one hand, I see real advantages to community banks that uh, know the communities, know the people they're dealing with. I also think we have to get regulation right because a lot of small banks are being smothered by regulations that are really targeted at the big banks. And that, you know, this, these regulations that we've rolled out are actually making it harder to be a small bank, and they're giving more advantages to big banks when they're supposed to be taking those advantages away. So to me, a lot of small banks, mid-sized banks, banks of all sizes, not so concentrated at the top end, and maybe more importantly, rational regulations that are tailored to the size institution and the risk that they pose. Kasai. You know, we hear all kind of theories about what the Feds uh, do and do not do by having just returned from D.C. to decide what the interest rate would be. The last couple of election cycles, the presidential election cycles, uh, especially the last year, we often hear that, uh, that uh, the decisions are influenced by politics, that they really, they don't just take into account the economy and so forth, which is in theory the way it should be, but that politics really weighs heavy into that so that they can influence the election one way or another. Would you care to comment on yeah, that? I'm, uh, yeah, I'm happy to comment on that. Uh, it's absolutely not true. Uh, absolutely not true. Uh, one of the things, my first uh, federal open market committee meeting, I was sitting there, and there's a giant map of the United States on one wall. And this is a very grand, ornate federal building, you know, a very old building. And I just kept thinking to myself, and I, I've got to believe when you were a congresswoman, you felt this way, and probably still do. I was so proud of our country that you know, we're able to attract people who care about their country, who want to do the right thing for their country, who don't let politics get in the way. So sitting around that table, there are people of all pol political stripes. I'm not supposed to talk about politics, but my background is well known. I was a Bush appointee. I've been a Republican. I ran for governor of California. I was a Republican nominee for governor of California in 2014 as a Republican. And I'm agreeing with people in terms of interest rates who are who I shouldn't be agreeing with if it were up to politics. We should be on the opposite sides of the table. But we're looking at the data and saying, what is the data telling us about the US economy? And let's make decisions based on what the data is providing us. And so I can tell you with no hesitation, politics is not factoring into anything that I have seen. It's reassuring. In the back there. In the back, yeah. Hi, Alan Kennedy with UBS. Uh, what do you see? as the biggest risk right now to the financial market stability. And I guess as a follow-up to that, with the ECB and Bank of Japan going to negative interest rates, do you see that as our future? And at, at what point would that be justified? Well, uh, there, there are a bunch of things happening in the global economy that we don't really understand. And so I'm a, an engineer, so I'm, you know, the, the culture of engineering is, generally one of a little bit of humility. And as an engineer, I feel very, I'm, I'm fine telling you what we don't know. And there's a lot that we don't know. So if you look around the world, interest rates since around 1980 have been gently gliding down all around the world, in the US, in Europe, in Japan. We don't exactly know why that is. It's a combination of a number of factors we think. For example, societies around the world are aging. We know that in America. But in Europe, it's even worse. And in Japan, it's even worse yet. So we think that an aging society is contributing to that. We think the way technology is being developed and adopted is contributing to that. But interest rates have been falling. They're not falling because of the Fed. We are manipulating interest rates around this long-term trend. But that long-term trend is being set for fundamental macroeconomic factors. So Japan and 
Europe are now seeing negative interest rates. Some countries have gone negative to try to push you, push their citizens, to get out and spend. Because if you're, if you're earning a negative rate on your savings, well, you don't want to do that. You better off just go buy a house or make an investment. We don't think we're going to need to do that in the US, and we think it's very unlikely we would do that, uh, in part because it's having some unintended consequences. So when Japan and Europe push their interest rates negative, it's supposed to spur spending and say, don't save as much. But it's actually scaring people. And people are saying, oh my gosh, how can interest rates be negative? Maybe I should save more. And so it may actually be having the opposite effect of what policymakers wanted. And so for a variety of reasons, we don't expect to have to do that in the US. I'll never say never. We have other tools that we could use to try to get the economy go growing again. But the biggest message is that you can't solve demographics with monetary policy. You can't solve some of these fundamental macroeconomic factors. And so a couple of weeks ago, I published an essay on the Minneapolis Fed website, which looks at what are the causes of the slowdown, what are the causes of the slow recovery, and what can we do about it? And it's things like investing in R&D, which the engineers here will like. It's things like better education, education reform, so our workforce has more skills, tax reform, regulatory reform, things that can get the economy more competitive and growing in the long term. Monetary policy can't solve these problems. And it's time for the other policymakers to step up and do their part. Neil, I, um, through the 2008 period, I, I read about the book about has you in it, The Big Short. And I understand your role at that time. I don't think I'm in The Big Short. I, Michael Lewis's book. Oh, okay. I can't remember which. It is book the big you, short, but I don't. Okay, anyway. Which I need to go books, back and check. I, I can't remember scary. the name of the book, but the one that was written it had you in there. It was yeah. quite interesting. But at that time, the problem with um, the banking industry was the two big to fail banks caused a, had a lot of problems. Now those same banks are much larger. Do you see that trend continuing? And do, uh, and I think of that as a risk point in this country. Um, as regulators, I don't think the regulators have any control over the large banks. You know, with the things that come out of late with Wells Fargo and stuff, they just can't know what's going on. What is long term going to happen with those banks as far as a risk point for our country? Yeah. Well, thank you for asking the question. Um, I joined the Minneapolis Fed in January, and in February I gave my first speech. And my first speech was the big banks are still too big to fail, and we need to do something about it. And I learned this firsthand living through the financial crisis. Actually, uh, Heather and I learned something about one another yesterday at dinner was that when I met her and I said, what years were you in Congress? And she explained, my first question was, did you vote for the TARP? <laughs> <laughs> and thankfully she did, because it was the right thing to do for the country. But we never want to have to do that again. And you're right, the biggest banks are bigger than they were before. Uh, in my judgment, if one of them ran into big trouble today, they would still have to turn to taxpayers. Because this is like, it's like a nuclear reactor. right? If a nuclear reactor melts down, it's devastating for society. So, do you, does that mean you ban nuclear reactors? No, not necessarily. It means you really regulate them so that they are very safe and secure, so that the odds of them running into trouble are exceptionally low. Well, the biggest banks today, in my judgment, are still too big to fail, and we need to consider much more serious action to address that problem. So what we're doing in Minneapolis is we announced an initiative that we, we call Ending Too Big to Fail, where we've had a series of public symposiums at our bank. We've brought the best experts in the world to Minneapolis to share their ideas, including break up the banks or turn them into utilities like nuclear, nuclear reactors. All of this work is culminating in us releasing our plan, the Minneapolis Fed's plan, to end too big to fail, which we're going to roll out by the end of the year. At the end of the day, it's up to you. At the end of the day, the American people have to decide how much risk you're willing to take and how much safety you want. But there's no free lunch. Right? It's just like terrorism. Each of you knows intuitively in your heart, we cannot take the risk of terrorism down to zero. There's always going to be some risk. And with more safety comes more costs. We pay for more law enforcement. We pay for more intelligence. So we as a country are making a decision of safety and costs as it relates to physical security. Well, we have to make that same decision as it relates to financial security. So what I'm committing to you is when we put out our plan, we're going to give you some options safety and costs, and you all get to decide, do we have it right or should we do more? And then it'll be up to you through your elected representatives to make that determination. 
if you would elaborate that, on that a little bit, and sure. what are the key ideas in your too big to fail plan that are different from uh, what happened the last time when they did reform? What, sure. what would make the outcome different? Well, one of the most powerful things that we've learned at, <clears throat> as we've drilled into this is how much capital a big bank has. So capital is the buffer to absorb losses when mistakes happen. And you know, human societies are prone to repeating the same mistakes. But it's not you and me. We don't, we're not going to repeat the same mistakes that you and me just made. It's going to be kids or grandkids or the future generations repeat past mistakes. So somehow we have to put in place regulations that protects future people from making the same mistakes that we made. The best tool that we've seen is increasing that buffer against bad mistakes in the future. You know, you can't legislate wisdom. Right? People are going to be stupid, and it's not illegal to be stupid. We all made mistakes. I bought a house in California in 2005, which in hindsight wasn't the smartest thing to do. But we're, so we're going to make mistakes. So if you have enough capital, it's like this. I learned about the flood here in Rapid City in 1972. Well, if you build a wall against a flood, the question is, how tall a wall do you want to build? Do you build for every 10-year flood, for a 100-year flood, for a 1,000-year flood? Well, the higher the wall is, the more expensive it is. And so in terms of increasing capital requirements for banks, there are costs associated with that. And that is, it may, may make it a little bit more expensive to get a mortgage, or to get a car loan, or a student loan. So we're running those trade-offs right now to figure out what's that height of the wall we should build where it makes sense for society to pay for that wall. You know, when we talk about the 08 crises, there are many factors that come into play. And one of them that dealt with the crises was the shadow banking system, where you had organizations like AIG and Countrywide who were not only making the loans and then selling them off, and then you had the problem of derivatives, where they were unregulated, so the notional value became very great. I don't think those have been, or that issue has been resolved. Can you speak to that a little bit, please? Sure. Well, there's, in some cases, progress has been made. So some of these really complex derivative contracts, what they've tried to do, instead of picture each of us, imagine each of us being a financial institution. And if each of us has individual contracts with one another, you end up getting thousands of contracts crisscrossing and overlapping, incredibly complicated, very hard to sort through. And when Lehman Brothers failed, that was part of what made that so painful, is how do you unravel these millions of contracts? So they've started moving some of these contracts onto exchanges so that we're all dealing with the exchange and able to net out some of our individual exposures. That's a step in the right direction. But the shadow banking system is still a very big concern. So let me go back for a second. If we were to jack up the capital requirements for the biggest banks, there's a real risk that that activity, that lending activity, would move from banks to hedge funds that don't have the same requirement. And then the question is, if all the activity just moves from the biggest banks to hedge funds, have we reduced risk? Or have we just moved it around? And these are the types of things that we're investigating in Minneapolis to figure out how can we put these pieces together so that we're not just pushing like a pillow here and it pops up over here. You got you to gotta factor all of that and the interconnection. So it's complicated, but it's not insurmountable. And, uh, and I, I'm excited. I think our plan is going to show real progress in these areas. Two-part question, I guess, to follow up a little bit on that. Uh, how confident are you that that hasn't, isn't already going on at a fairly high level? But my second question is um, uh, Stanley Fisher, I think uh, Dallas Fed, um, has said that the trade-off between uh, savers and investors that negative interest rates are, are worth that, or zero to negative interest rates, um, punishing the savers at the benefit of the borrowers is worthwhile. Can you share your thoughts on that or what the FOMC in general is thinking along those lines? Well, um, tell me your first part again, because you, you got me thinking on your second part. Now I lost your first part. Your earlier question you oh, mentioned is it about the, 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 the migration is already going yeah. off. Um, the migration, I think it is probably happening because we see uh, some hedge funds, for example, getting in small business lending 
uh, where finance companies like GE Capital and others used to do that. Now it's more independent kind of companies that are doing that. And I think that's OK. I think that, in fact, that may be a good thing. For example, if, if lending moves from a $2 trillion bank to a bunch of small banks or moves to a bunch of small hedge funds, I think I would argue risk has been reduced because it's not concentrated with one management team, one board of directors, and one giant vehicle. The problem becomes if a $2 trillion bank all moves to and becomes a giant hedge fund that's not subject to banking regulation, that's a systemic risk that we need to look out for. So not all migration is bad. It's migration at scale and concentration that I think we need to be most concerned about. As for, um, so there are two Fishers. One is former Dallas Fed President Richard Fisher, and then the current Vice Chairman of the Federal Reserve is Stanley Fisher. Um, I, I don't know what he has said about uh, negative interest rates. I, I don't think he's been a proponent of them, but I, I'll let him speak for himself. Um, our view is, as I've, we've talked about it internally, is that the US economy is different than some of these smaller European economies or the Japanese economies. Our money market industry is different. Going to negative rates may well have other unintended consequences for the US economy that some of these other countries aren't subject to. And that's why our view is this is not something we'd ever say never. It's impossible. But it's not very likely. We think we have other tools to try to stimulate the economy. For example, if a recession were to hit us and rates are already low, we don't feel like we're out of ammunition. But going to negative interest rates wouldn't be one of the early things that we'd want to do. What? Such as? Such as. So, um, in the, so normally, in normal times, the Federal Reserve tries to get the economy growing again by lowering short-term interest rates. And that can be very powerful. Well, short-term rates are already near zero today. So during the crisis, the Fed launched something you've probably heard about called quantitative easing, which is a fancy name for saying the Fed bought long-term bonds, treasury bonds, mortgage-backed securities, to drive down long-term interest rates. So once you've got low short-term interest rates at zero, then what do you do? You try to drive down long-term interest rates. The reason that matters is because if you're buying a house or you're building a factory, you don't just care about what the interest rate's going to be for the next month. Right? You wanna, you're going to make an investment over five or 10 years. You care what that interest rate's going to look like over the next 10 years. And that's why driving down long-term interest rates was very powerful coming out of the crisis. The Fed, if need, be, if need be, could do more of that to continue trying to drive down long-term interest rates to get people moving again. But again, these policies are useful in the short term. They cannot solve fundamental factors like demographics or slow innovation. Uh, th some of these things are what are really holding back the US economy now. Sorry, that was a long answer to your question, but it was a complicated question. I have a historical perspective question. Looking back, uh, when the TARP program was implemented to keep liquidity in the economy, uh, do you have any insight as to why, the, why the, the, the media did such a horrible job of explaining to the average American why the TARP program was so essential? And is there a lesson in that for the, for the Fed for the next time we have a financial crisis? You know, this is a complicated one. This touches on what we talked about at dinner. It wasn't just the media representing it to the public. It was also policymakers explaining it to members of Congress and senators. You know, I, I learned this, that um, members of Congress and senators have a tough job for a lot of reasons, one of which is they have to weigh in on issues from national security to health care to energy to economics, to veterans, it's so broad. Whereas somebody like me gets to just focus on the economy, it's much easier for us to become expert in, in a, a small number of topics. And so we really struggled to explain the crisis to people who are not in the middle of it or not dealing with these markets every day. And you know, when we would go up and I would brief members of Congress or senators, they would say to us or their staffs would say, our phones are ringing off the hook 99 to 1 saying, don't you dare vote for that because we don't see a crisis. And all we could say is, trust us, they will feel it soon. And you know, our democracy is very good at cleaning up a mess after it's happened. It's much harder to reach consensus to try to prevent something that might be happening over the horizon. And I don't have a good answer for you on that. I mean, we need to build trust. We need to repair the trust that's been damaged. And what I'm trying to do at the Fed is I'm trying to, in any way that I can, increase our engagement with the public. 
because the more we communicate with the public, the more we let you see in, the more we let you see how we're thinking about things, the better chance we have of earning your trust. Because when these issues happen, they're incredibly complex. You can't explain this level of complexity to 300 million people. But if you've earned those people's trust, they'll give you the benefit of the doubt. And so we need to earn that trust. Let me follow up on that. You were right in the middle of things. What from that time was unreported or misreported that you look back now and you think, yeah, they completely missed it? I think, I mean, a lot of things. Um, things that stand out for me are, like in my comments about the Federal Reserve earlier, the quality of people that we had and the reason they were there. So when we were negotiating the TARP, I had some members of Congress ask me, how many people do you think you're going to need to run this? I said, I don't know, 10 or 15. Uh, in six months, I would hired 140 people. Right? We had no idea how complicated this was going to be, what was going to happen. And we had people volunteering from across the country saying, I want to come serve. And I know, when I, by the time I talked to them, I said, let me just be very clear with you. I've read your resume. You're very qualified. I get that. I need you to come here for no, more, no fewer than four months. You're going to work for very little money compared to what you're making now. You're going to work no fewer than six days a week, no less than 12 hours a day. You're not going to see your family, and you're really going to get criticized. Are you sure you want this? Because don't waste my time if you don't. You wouldn't believe how many hands went down and said, so, you know what, now is not the right time. But the people who then said yes, and we didn't care if they were Republicans or Democrats or Libertarians, it didn't matter. We wanted people who were there for the right reasons to help us get through the crisis. And so I'm enormously proud of the job that was done at Treasury, at the Federal Reserve, uh, around the government, of people saying, country first, what do we have to do? And uh, I'm proud to be associated with them. And I feel like, honestly, one of the worst moments in our nation's economic history, one of the finest moments in our nation's political history. I'm going to go a little local here. Um, one thing that the Rapid City area Black Hills have is a pretty low unemployment rate. And um, I, I guess I wondered what your thoughts were on trying to spur economic development in a uh, community where it's not just as easy as getting people to work, where you are trying to convince companies to come here that look at it and say, well, maybe we don't have enough people to hire, um, that sort of thing. Well, it's a tough problem. I mean, it's a little bit of chicken and egg. But as I travel all around the Ninth District, I hear these type of concerns and these ambitions from communities all around the Ninth District. And frankly, you all are way better off than most others because you have a world-class university here. I mean, that's a huge, huge draw for potential employers around the country who would consider moving here. You have an Air Force base. You have the ag sector. You have a vibrant downtown. You have a diverse uh, economic system here. And so, you know, I think people will come. It's like, look at North Dakota. There was an oil boom. People came from around the country to go service and take advantage of the oil boom. Uh, I think if you keep doing what you're doing and you keep investing in the university and the relationship with the university and the medical center that you have here, that's another reason why people you know, want to come here, because you've got very high quality medical system. I don't think that there's, at least I haven't seen a silver bullet. I feel like you have all the pieces in place. You just need to keep doing what you're doing and taking, taking advantage of them. And maybe there are other structural barriers. I mean, sometimes you'll hear from company. I don't know how easy it is to get goods in and out of here. So is it possible you could benefit from more investment in rail or highways? I don't know. You, know. you all know that better than I do. But those are the types of things that I think can unlock the potential. But it seems to me like you've got the components here. I don't know. What do you think? You're, you've been here for a few years now. You're not supposed to ask me questions. I know. But see, <laughs> <laughs> but see having, I know you were a member of Congress for 10 years, so I know you can handle questions. <laughs> Well, one of the things that was surprising to me when I came here was this East River, West River thing. And, and it seemed very funny to me. Um, and, and there are cultural differences that come from geology and geography. Um, uh, but but uh, one of the things that was always, that, that I think is, uh, is, seems to be going away somewhat in the community now, is Rapid City in Western South Dakota has so much going for it. You're right. We have a, 
an Air Force base. We have a strong ag sector. We've got a fantastic, we've got, you know, a, a, a tourist attraction that's not just a tourist attraction. It's on everybody's bucket list. Yeah. Um, we've got a university. We've got a, the regional health care system. We are the retail hub for 200 miles around. There are small communities across this country that are trying to get more than one sector and are worried that their air base is going to close or they're, they're worried that the one big employer is going to close or you know, if ag goes upside down, we're all in deep trouble. Um, we have all of those things. So we have a tremendous opportunity to build on strength. And, and not have to worry too much about diversification. So yeah. I think it's an exciting time to be in Rapid City. One of the things that's probably somewhat unique in the Ninth District we have in South Dakota are the numerous Indian reservations and economic issues are huge on those reservations. What, if anything, can the Fed do to address the issues we have on our reservations? Yeah, it's, so this is a topic that's enormously important that I'm beginning to learn about. Uh, I have a lot to learn. And we have, one of the things I found at the Minneapolis Fed is a couple years ago, we launched a center called the Center for Indian Country Development to specifically study these economic issues. Everything from uh, land use, you know, the ability of people to get mortgages on property that may have multiple people claiming ownership of it, to education issues, to just access to credit, financial inclusion. I mean, these are enormously complex issues that have come about over many, many decades. So we know, for example, monetary policy can't solve this. We can't target monetary policy. It's, the, it's a blunt instrument across the entire United States of America. So we can't target it in specific states or specific communities. But we do have a lot of research expertise. And if we are able to understand these issues and be an honest broker and bring people from around the community together to try to address these issues, then I think we can make progress. So this is something that's very much on our radar screens. It's one of our priorities, uh, but I also want to set expectations. These are, like I said, decades in the making. They're not going to get solved easily, but if we can play a role, we are going to do our best to play that role. My question has to do with uh, timing. <clears throat> if you could uh, visit with us about the timing of Fed actions as it relates to doing too little, too late, or too much, too soon. Um, outside looking in, it looks a little like the Fed is just frozen right now on what to do. And could you just comment about um, the concerns that you know, we have regarding some of the timing and how that's going to play out in the near future? Sure. Well, um, so Congress gave us, we, we report, we work for Congress, therefore we work for you. But Congress gave us what's called a dual mandate which is we want to achieve stable prices and maximum employment. Now, we've defined, as most central banks have, stable prices means 2% inflation. So that's our target. The reason it's not zero is because deflation is a really bad thing. We want to avoid deflation, so we give ourselves a little bit of margin of error. That's why it's 2% inflation. Well, the US, for the last four years, we've been coming up low on our inflation target. But it's not just us. Europe has been coming up low. Japan has been coming up low, developed economies all around the world. Go back to where I started. A lot of these things are global phenomena that are affecting us here also. So inflation's been too low, and yet the job market is creating a lot of jobs. So the question is, if we start raising rates, what's that going to do to inflation, and what's that going to do to the job market? If you raise rates, that tends to push inflation down. So the fact that inflation is coming up low suggests there's no urgency to hurry up and raise rates. And if you raise rates, that tends to slow the job market down. So one really positive surprise in the last three or four years, coming out of the Great Recession, a lot of experts thought we would have a lost generation of workers as the long-term unemployed became permanently unemployable. They'd just be lost. Well, and that's how the unemployment statistics showed them. Well, in the last three or four years, much to our surprise, pleasantly, people have been coming off the sidelines and re-entering the labor force. So we're seeing a process where people that we thought did not want to work now do want to work, are getting jobs. It's not causing inflation. And so the headline unemployment rate has been stuck because people are entering the numerator and the denominator, which is a really good thing. So that's a long answer to say we're coming up short on inflation. Inflation expectations remain anchored. 
from my, my opinion, there does not appear to be any urgency to go raise rates when inflation is coming up low. Final point, from a risk management perspective, if I'm wrong and inflation surprises us, we have all the tools we need to bottle it up. We will then raise rates and there's commitment to keeping inflation in check. But if inflation is too low, like Europe, like Japan, we don't want to have to turn to things like negative rates to try to get inflation back up again. And so from a risk management perspective, in my opinion, waiting too long is less of a risk than moving too soon. Sorry, complicated answer. Someone in the back here. I'm curious at what your, uh, uh, what your view is of where the banking structure is going. Uh, I've been a community banker for 25 years. When I first got into it, they said, a lot of people are saying, community banks won't be around in 15, 20 years. Never believed it. I see the value in it. You all probably do too. And so, but I see it as a little bit more of a threat with a lot of consolidation due to the regulatory burdens as well as credit unions without tax burdens, having more powers. And I just wanted to see what your thought was and where the banking structure could be. Is it going to be a more consolidation or what you foresee? And I guess what's your opinion, what you'd like to see? Yeah, I think uh, if we don't change anything, more consolidation is coming for the reasons you said, which is the regulations that are now hitting community banks. You know, if a, if a mid-sized bank has to hire one compliance officer, no big deal. If a community bank with, that has 10 employees has to hire one compliance officer, it's a very big deal. So they can't afford it. That forces them to merge. And it's forcing more consolidation among the smallest banks in particular. So unless somebody does something, that trend is going to continue. And so I'm hopeful that with our plan on too big to fail, you know, I think that there's, I think there's bipartisan support to try to relieve some of the burden on community banks because community banks are not systemically risky. If a community bank fails, it's painful for that community, but it's not going to plunge the whole U.S. economy into recession or depression. So I think there's a bipartisan consensus that we need to get that right, but I think it's getting caught up in the concerns around the biggest banks. So my hope is if we as a country can really do something about the biggest banks and have confidence that we've done that, then there will be the opportunity to then relax some of the regulations that are smothering the community banks. And so to me, I do think community banks are enormously important. We need a regulatory system that makes sense uh, for them. And we need to address too big to fail. So very important. And, and I'm hopeful that we can do our part in getting there. Here. I'd be curious to find, or at least get your interpretation, your ideas on where we are headed in terms of a recession, um, with all the strength in the Ninth District and locally, you know, your data supports that. How do you see the U.S. economy going forward? There are a lot of regional economists right now who are forecasting what they would even call a violent recession within the next 18 months. So we look at uh, all the data we can get our hands on, and we're not seeing alarm bells saying a recession is imminent. We have various indices that we create and we look at which tries to forecast the probability of a recession in the next year or two. From the last data that I looked at, none of those are particularly elevated right now. Um, but you never know. I mean, predict predicting recessions is enormously difficult. The people who are good at it usually have about 10 false positives for every recession they happen to get right. Uh, that doesn't help us, right? We need to make calls based on the best data we have available. And so it seems like things are continuing to go reasonably well, kind of sluggish growth, not as fast as we'd like. But certainly not in recession, but we have to be on guard. And shocks can come from all over the place. You know, if there was a big oil price spike unexpectedly, uh, that could be a, a big headwind on the US economy. And that seems very unlikely right now, doesn't it? But when oil was 150, I know nobody predicted it going to 30. And so these things are very hard to predict. Um, or if, you know, Brexit, so you know, the UK deciding to leave the, Euro the Eurozone, we didn't think that was going to happen. But it ended up having less of an immediate shock than we had expected. So that's a good thing. But we don't yet know how it's going to play out. We don't know what the negotiation between the UK and the Eurozone is going to be like. Is it going to be a me messy exit? Is it going to lead to other countries wanting to exit? You know, The world, as you all know, is an unpredictable place. And so nothing right now that we see is saying recession is imminent. But you know, we've all been surprised before. 
Let me jump in and ask a question. If, if you could go back and make one or two major changes to either Sarbanes-Oxley or Dodd-Frank, what would they be? I know a lot more about Dodd-Frank than I know about Sarbanes-Oxley. Um, I think Dodd-Frank, now I don't want to front run a, the, our plan on too big to fail. So I'll just say this, I think that Dodd-Frank was not tough enough on the biggest banks. And the, the net was cast too wide. So it caught up too many banks that are not systemically important. Uh, but it didn't do enough on the biggest ones that are systemically important. Uh, and that's a concern. Uh, that's a real concern to me. Over here. So every day we hear that the national debt is approaching $20 trillion and going up at a faster rate. And intuitively, you've got to believe that that's some kind of a disaster out there in the future. How do we not come to that conclusion? Well, in the near term, it's not a disaster because in some sense, the best thing we have going for us is that we are the strongest economy in the world, even though we're not as strong as we'd like to be. So investors all around the world are investing in US treasuries, our debt, because they think it's the safest debt in the world. So that's a good thing, and we want to preserve that. And the biggest risk to that over the long term is because of our entitlement programs, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. And this is all math. I'm not offering a value judgment. It's just simple that most of these programs are paid for by current workers paying for current retirees. And as our society ages, that ratio gets out of whack. And that's just arithmetic. And so we have to make some changes. And that's a political calculus. It's not the Fed. Ultimately, the American people have to decide, what do you want to do? Do you want to change the way benefits are growing? Do you want to increase taxes? Do you somehow want to get the fertility rate up? You know, Some countries are trying to get their fertility rates up. Do you want to embrace immigration more so we have more workers? These are three or four or five different options. And literally, it just comes down to a political uh, consensus of which of those levers do you want to pull so that these programs are come into balance. Because if they don't come into balance, you're right. We're going to have, someday we're going to have a fiscal disaster because we simply can't afford deficits going through the roof. The good news is it's not right now. The bad news is it's not easy to reach consensus. You've talked an awful lot about too big to fail. Out in this part of the country, you have a lot of small communities. Have you ever looked at too small to survive? You know, I hear this a lot uh, when I travel around the Ninth District from small communities that are looking for new industries that they could bring to their communities. Maybe it's a, a mining town, and those mines you know, are no longer competitive or no longer operational, or it's a timber town, uh, et cetera. So I think it's a very common challenge. Uh, it's, it's hard for me, taking a broad view, to make assessments of you know, this should be here and that should be there. You, you, in some sense, you have to let the market work. But I think you want to try to give the communities the tools that they need to make their own investment decisions to do what's right for their communities. You know, I'm, I met with a, I was in um, the Iron Range in northern Minnesota, which is struggling because the iron ore mines, a lot of them have shut down because iron ore prices are down. And I was meeting with some folks there, and an older lady said to me, you know, our population is decreasing. You know, what are we going to do about it? And I said, where are your children? And they said, oh, they all left. And I said, well, did you want them to stay? No, I wanted them to leave so they could go get better opportunity. I said, OK, but I, then I'm not going to criticize somebody else for making that same choice. And so you know, I don't know. These are, these are tough questions as economies evolve and markets evolve. Um, I don't know if there's a right answer. You know, When the Ninth District, the Ninth Federal Reserve District, so Minnesota, North and South Dakota, Montana, part of Michigan, part of Wisconsin, when these districts were created 100 years ago, they all had roughly the same population. Now the 12th district, which is California, the whole West Coast, has about 60 million people. And the 9th district has 8 or 9 million people. And so you know, the country evolves. That's probably not a satisfactory answer, but it's not an easy thing to solve. 
Well, I thank you for inviting me today. I thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules and for asking me some really good questions. And thank you for, uh, for hosting and moderating. Neil, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to have you here in Rapid City and a pleasure to have you at the School of Mines. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. This is great.